Um, so welcome to all of you. Thank you very much for coming to um, to our to our forum on accessible transport and uh, a discussion around free to move accessible transport in Victoria. My name is Kath Smith and I'm the CEO of VCOS uh, and a number of VCOS team members are here um, for the session today as, as well as uh, board members. Um, and um, we're, we've uh, changed the program slightly um, early in the piece because uh, we're all a bit excited because uh, our new Minister for Transport, this is his first public engagement. So oh. when he became available, um, we were pretty pleased that given that public transport and transport generally has been such a huge election issue, the fact that this forum has been the first forum that our new Minister chooses to come to, um, to us is a very positive and uh, hopefully a fantastic symbol of things to come. So, um, so I'll just uh, get us started. So welcome to all of you. Um, uh, before I go on, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the, the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to elders past and present and to um, any elders who are with us in the room today. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity, and I haven't seen them yet, to introduce our Auslan interpreters for the day. Are they here? Oh, sorry. I was so busy looking at the microphone, I wasn't looking at you. Um, so Mark and Megan, thank you very much, our Auslan interpreters. Um, and we're also, um, as you can see from the camera, we're recording this morning's proceedings. So um, there, there will be, hopefully, a few minutes for question and answer, so please be aware that um, we, we will be filming you and filming the proceedings today, so do let our team know afterwards if you've got any concerns about that. Um, so the reason why we're running this forum, Free to Move, Planning for Action on Accessible Transport, is due to VCOS's and, and the sector's very long interest in transport issues, the importance of transport in people's lives, whether it's to get to the work or shops or to the doctor or education or friends and family. And without good transport services, people can have trouble just getting out of their homes and are at risk of isolation, poverty and sickness. So we've been advocating for many years, as have many of you in the room today, there's some familiar faces uh, for people who've been advocating to improve the accessibility of our transport system so that more people can use it, building independence and transport choice. So we're very pleased to extend a warm welcome to, our, to the speaker who's kicking off the morning's proceedings. Um, now, the, the Honourable Terry Mulder uh, is with us only probably for about 10 minutes, so I'm going to move straight on now, um, and I'm going to hand over because he's got another meeting he's got to be at. So I'm going to hand over now, and then if there's not time to get to all the questions, there'll be a, an opportunity um, to uh, have a discussion and, um, and follow up later. So thank you very much. Please welcome Terry Mulder. Thank you, uh, Kath, for the invitation to come along this morning. Um, before I came this morning, I got a text message from a, uh, a nun who used to teach me at St Mary's School in Colac. When I first went to school, uh, when I was five years old, I couldn't talk. I had a bad stutter. And this uh, polio, and she had calipers on. So she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she said, I think I can do something for you. So morning, lunch, afternoon, she used to take me aside and read with me. And within three months, the stutter was gone. So I sent back a message to her. Thanks for your congratulations. I'm about to attend my first formal function, minus a stutter. <laughs> so um, my department prepared a, an actual speech for me. I'm not going to go through that speech, and as I indicated to, to Kath, that when I come along in future, the way that I like to conduct my, I suppose, um, addresses or my information sessions is to perhaps sit around in a circle uh, where people can actually talk to me and uh, throw questions at me feed information to me and I'll have a couple of advisors who'll take on board all the information. I don't want to be a minister who makes a speech and bolts out the door uh, because that way I don't get the feedback that I want. I won't get the information uh, that I want from you. Um, Kathy indicated I come from the country. She said, I hope that means we'll get some practical solutions to the, the problems that uh, we have and that people with disabilities and people with uh, lack of access to public transport face. And uh, I've addressed a couple of those matters uh, already in some of our uh, policy announcements and some direction I've given to the department uh, in relation to how we actually build public transport infrastructure and that I don't believe that there is enough input from people who actually use that infrastructure. It's usually built and then they're asked to come and comment on it and find out what's wrong with it. And uh, a simple example is that Laverton 
a $92 million railway station that has a lift that continually breaks down. Uh, all that's left for people uh, at that particular location is a steep staircase <coughs> or a taxi around to the other side. Um, I want to make sure that people who work in those facilities, people who use those facilities, people with disabilities, people who have difficulty because of their age in being able to uh, use public transport or other means of transport actually have an input into what we build. That, that, that we address those needs in the very early design stages and don't find ourselves with a $92 million project that doesn't actually work for the people. Um, I had a, I had a, I had, my mum went through a, a stage of dementia. There are some real issues, I think, within the medical profession in terms of how um, people who have lost their independence, that that message is conveyed to different agencies to realise it's the person within the community who does need some form of assistance. There are a lot of agencies out there there's a medical profession here, but there seems to be a breakdown in communication in connecting a lot of people to those types of services. We've also got a situation with uh, older drivers, and I've made some pretty strong policy commitments in relation to that. I have situations in regional Victoria whereby an older driver, and it's happened on a number of occasions, older drivers uh, get a letter from Vic Roads, you are to be retested, someone has reported you, you'll be retested, turn up for a test, um, they turn up, they're put into a car they've never driven before, five or six minutes to familiarise themselves with it, away they go, fail the test, you've lost your licence. Sit another test once again, an unfamiliar vehicle, try the test, fail, third time around, um, they might get through it. But if someone in that sort of circumstance actually loses their licence, and I've had a situation, elderly people who are living out on a farm with an invalid husband, totally, completely isolated, and the minute that that decision's been made, uh, no referral, no connection in relation to other in relation to other types of transport for them. So one of the uh, policy positions that I'm taking to Vic Roads is that older drivers should be uh, able to take a test in their own car. That brings about issues in relation to occupational health and safety uh, for the licensed testers. But what I'm asking them to look at is an observation test. Uh, quite often people are reported uh, because they've seen, been seen to do something that's not right on the road, because they're older, they're pushed into a, a, a test situation. With a younger driver, that doesn't happen. With an older driver, it does happen. And I want to make sure there's a sense of fairness and a sense of balance uh, in the way that those sort of decisions are made as we go forward. So, as I say, I'll be asking Big Rose to develop a test uh, for older drivers, that if they wish to, um, that they can take a test in their own car. That may be at a driving range, it may well be that a, uh, a licence tester follows them to see how they actually uh, carry out their, uh, their driving. It may well be having an inboard in uh, uh, video to see how they're performing behind the wheel. But it is at a distinct disadvantage for someone who's been driving a certain type of vehicle for 10 years or so to be all of a sudden put into a brand new vehicle, different clutch pressure, different brake pressure, accelerator pressure, everything is different about the vehicle and then ask them to familiarise themselves in a short period of time and pass a driving test. So I believe that that's, uh, that's, that's extremely important. Uh, it will make a, a lot of difference to a lot of older drivers. As I say, I've seen a lot of them fail on a number of occasions and pass on, on a third occasion, but it's very, very expensive, very expensive. So it's a matter of being fair. It's a matter of making sure that, um, number one, we don't want to keep people on the road who are dangerous. I think everyone realises and understands that, but it's a matter of being fair. And I don't think the current system uh, as it stands, uh, is fair to older drivers. Uh, we've given a commitment in relation to uh, a, a series of new rolling stock, new trains, uh, new trams. Uh, naturally, the needs of uh, people in this room we take into consideration. As I say, my role is to make sure that when we go through designing, whether it's rolling stock or whether it's designing trams, we don't get to the end of cutting a ribbon on, on a project and everyone says this doesn't work for us. So it's very important that we get that uh, grassroots uh, and ground level uh, support from people who are involved. Um, you've got a new government, uh, you've got a new premier, uh, early announcements, uh, extension of uh, energy concessions, uh, cutting ambulance uh, subscriptions in half. Uh, we are very much aware of the pressure that's currently being applied to not only families, but people who are on single incomes, uh, people who are in receipt, receipt of uh, pensions that. Um, that they're going to feel an enormous amount of pressure because of decisions that have been made in the past. Uh, it's our intention as a government to take as much pressure as we possibly can of vulnerable people within the community and with families within the community. And so some of those decisions have already been announced by Tech Value. 
and as we go forward, I think you'll find there'll be further decisions uh, and further announcements that will be made, taking into consideration uh, people who, as I say, single incomes, people on pensions, and certainly uh, families who are under an enormous amount of pressure at this point in time. Um, I don't have a long a period of time, as you said, Kat, so I'm more than happy to take some questions. Um, understanding that I've had a series of very small briefings from my department. Um, I don't have staff in place at this point in time, but I will come back, uh, and when I do come back, it'll be in a forum, if we can, as you can, and it won't be in the form of a stand-up speech and bolt for the door. So, um, as I say, my first official function, uh, I'm very, very happy and pleased that it's uh, PCOS, because I do understand uh, the needs of uh, people in our community, and I do understand the role that PCOS plays in it as, as great advocacy for those uh, different groups and organisations. So, more than happy to take any questions. Uh, Mr Mulder, congratulations on your portfolio. Um, what is the Liberal Party going to do about the old infrastructure? Do they have plans to look at that, uh, do a review and improve it? Because that is the basic um, need for all public transport. Look, it, it, it's a work in progress, and as I pointed out uh, when I took on this role, I've been in the office now for a week, um, and uh, certainly I'll be getting briefings from the department. Naturally, we've got to go through the process of DDA compliance uh, and, and work through a lot of those. What I want to make sure is this. is the money that I have allocated to me for public transport is prioritised in such a manner that we get the best outcome for the people who are using the public transport network. That has not happened in the past. I don't want to see money put into projects like Mikey ticketing systems and, you know, the priorities that don't actually deliver an on-ground benefit to people. So I'm going through a whole host of the projects that are currently being undertaken by the government. I'm looking at what contracts have and have not been signed. Uh, I want to have a look at how the priorities have been set. But can I assure you that uh, your needs and your concerns will be the forefront of my decision making as we go forward to make sure, as I say, the money we spend, we get the best possible outcome. And I don't want outcomes like Laverton. I've already given instructions to the department about some of the new railway stations that are being built, and that I want to go back to the people who use them, those who have special needs in terms of the use of those stations to make sure we get the best outcome. It's not going to be an overnight fix in relation to the old infrastructure, but can I tell you I'm acutely aware particularly with some of the old rolling stock. That's a matter of replacement. Um, some of the challenges on railway stations, getting people on and off tra uh, trains on platforms that don't have you know, proper ramp facilities in and out of the trains, and it's also an issue for the operator in terms of on-time running. So I understand that they're trialling um, some uh, works on platforms to see whether or not they can do that and do it better and do it quicker, but uh, we don't have a final result at this point in time. <coughs> Minister, uh, yes. uh, just um, on your point of speech there on the older driver and uh, without trying to labour that as a point, you took it to a point though where you're saying we'll test them again or make it a lot easier for testing, but the big problem is not just there, it's what happens after that. Many will continue to fail, many will lose their licences and then we lose a lot of things like our rec recognition of who we are or independence. Um, what's the next step for those that continue to fail? Because how do we then get around the community if it's just public transport and quite often many can't? We're talking about yeah. isolation in the country. Yeah. Is it the community transport system going to be looked at as a broader picture for that type of work? We need the 